So good morning. Um, my name is Sophia Briard, and I am the project coordinator here at the Ontario Centre of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health. Um, and I'm here to welcome you to our e-forum, For Youth by Youth, Creating a Community That Promotes Lives Worth Living. This is the second um, forum in our series of five free e-forums on specific topics related to community mobilization and youth life promotion and suicide prevention. These e-forums are part of Ontario's Youth Suicide Prevention Plan, which supports Ontario's mental health and addiction strategy. Today our presenters are three fabulous youth that support a lot of our work here at the Centre, Trina Hall, Taylor Holden, and Alicia Raimondo. Taylor Holden is a mental health advocate based in London, Ontario. She sorts books and plays small instruments. She is passionate about coffee, Netflix, and youth engagement. Trina Hall is a 22-year-old student from Sarnia, Ontario. Currently, she is attending her final year at Western University, studying psychology and sociology with the hopes of working in the field of mental health. She spends her time managing a part-time job serving coffee to sleep deprived students, university students, being a member of a sorority on campus, and volunteering in her free time. Since the age of 15, she has been actively engaged in mental health work, having volunteered with organizations such as the, Prin the Provincial Advocates Office for Children and Youth and at Mind Your Mind. Most recently, she was a member of a group of youth who created the Be Safe app. And a fun fact about Trina is that this summer she spent her time traveling around Italy and Thailand. Alicia Raimondo has been described as a mental health superhero. Battling serious bouts of anxiety, depression, and a suicide attempt since the age of 13. More recently, she used her move to the University of Waterloo as a catalyst to seek help and eventually to help others living with mental health issues. Since then, she has given two TED Talks, was named one of 2012 Faces of Mental Illness, spoke at Clinton Global Initiative, and recently returned from speaking at the UN's International Youth Day at the UN headquarters in New York. She published Red Carnation, a book on suicide prevention that will be used in grade 8 classrooms across Canada and represented Canada and Thailand at One Young World. So before I let them take it away, I just wanted to cover a few logistical pieces. So for one, all the slides and the recording from today's session will be posted on the event webpage, and I'll share that link in the chat box in a second. Um, so you can go there after the fact, um, after this session to, to view this session again. Um, for those who are interested in a participa participation, participation um, certificate, I can provide one to you. You just need to um, contact me through an email, and I'll, po I'll post that through the chat box in a second as well. All questions for our presenters today can be directed through the chat box function, um, and we will hold all those questions till after each of um, our wonderful young ladies um, have a chance to speak. Um, and so that pretty much covers the logistical pieces. Um, so I'm going to let Trina take it away, because I believe she's starting us off today. Yes. Okay. okay, so hopefully, is it working? Yeah, okay. Uh, I just wanted to make sure before I start talking. Okay, so what I wanted to kind of go over first was just the different types of youth engagement and how um, organizations can uh, have youth be a part of their team. Okay, so the first one um, is treatment. So for this one, it's not actually, um, not necessarily relevant to what we're doing, just because it's hard to have youth engaged in advocacy-based, uh, it's, it's, it's practiced at the clinical level within organizations, but it's not necessarily applicable to youth suicide prevention activities at a community level. Um, I've never actually personally been engaged in treatment. Trina, um, Trina, sorry, yeah. to, uh, do you mind just muting your computer? There's a bit of feedback. 
Does that work? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Go up. I'll, I'll. Does yeah. that work? Yes? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> do I want to start again or do I want to? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the first one was treatment and basically it's just practice at the clinical level with an organization. Um, so it's not necessarily applicable to youth suicide prevention at the community level. Um, the second one is advocacy and education. So this is the one that I've been more so a part of um, in my own experiences. Um, so this one has the aim of shifting policy and uh, creating changes um, within communities. So the youth can share their experiences, um, they can try to increase, increase awareness through their own experiences and they're um, engaged in their community. So this could be, you know, creation of youth suicide prevention action plans. Um, the third one um, is research and evaluation. So at this level, youth are engaged as toll evaluators. Um, so they evaluate the effectiveness of initiatives and how well it um, can be in the community. Um, and they also are engaged as co-researchers. So this could be things as identifying issues that they see as important. Um, they can collect and analyze data, et cetera. Um, and the third one would be within government and policy. So at this level, um, youth are engaged in co-creation um, of policies and procedures, and they also help to implement them within the community. And it could also be um, that they are representing governance structures as well. Um, the one that I have had most experience with, as I had said, was with advocacy and education. Um, so for this one, it was actually the very first um, organization that I was engaged with as a youth. Um, it was the advocacy office, uh, provincial advocates office for children and youth in Toronto. Um, so I thought this one would be particularly um, helpful to discuss just because it was such a positive experience, even though it was more than seven years ago, but it's still something that I have um, positive feeling towards, and it, it was a really good start to me continuing being engaged um, throughout my adolescence and now young adulthood. Um, and I think also it spoke to the importance of reaching youth through a way that is accessible to them. Um, I was able to find out about the advocate's office and what they were doing through um, email, um, but it, it wasn't necessarily that it was just, you know, spammed through and given to a lot of different people. Um, it was strategically given to people that had connections with youth um, in certain areas that they were looking for. So um, they send the email out to staff at St. Clair Child Youth Center in Sarnia who have probably the highest direct um, connection to youth um, with one, mental health issues, two, um, better living in group homes, group care, and whatnot. So I think it was really um, strategic in the sense that they placed it in the right hands and it was they were able then to connect to youth and, and ask them if they wanted to be a part of it and use their own experiences. Um, they also, um, they have the log logistical aspects of it that were positive um, as well. You know, they provided honorarium, which isn't always um, available. Um, and I know that some organizations are not always able to give honorariums for the youth time. and. And other things that could probably be done as well would be, you know, um, maybe a reference letter or some sort of certificate to say that they participated in it, just something that the youth could use even to progress in their own development with school and with work and with volunteering. Um, they also reimburse us for travel experience uh, expenses, um, or they arrange to offer to arrange travel for us as well. And they also um, asked us if we wanted to um, have our parents come along and or our guardian just to ease any anxiety that we may have, especially because a lot of the youth um, were at risk or it was youth that were suffering from mental health illnesses. So it's important to, to make them feel as comfortable as possible. Um, you know, they provide things logistically, just, you know, lunch and breakfast and an overnight stay if they were out of town. And the one thing that I wanted to touch further on was just that they, they had youth that were just from a range of 
you know, locations and backgrounds. They had Aboriginal youth um, that they've flown in from up north, which is very important, especially because they are such a typically unacceptable group given their location. Um, and they also had youth, you know, in conflict with the law, youth that lived in community care, which I was at the time, and youth with disabilities, uh, physical and mental. So that logistically it was um, very positive in that sense. And um, I also wanted to just touch on the fact that they they were very positive in the sense that they um, they really covered a lot of the guiding principles that um, are a part of, um, I know they, I think it's a part of the toolkit that um, is on the website that it probably could be looked at further. I only want to touch on a few of them, just, um, you know, the, the range of youth and youth experiences that they were able to um, have was really good. It was, um, you know, a lot of marginalized youth, uh, which appeared to be a priority for them to get youth from a wide range of um, wide range of issues and groups and experiences. And they also had us, um, there were different areas that they could be a part of. You could, if you weren't comfortable speaking in front of large groups, they also, you know, split into smaller groups just to discuss things further. It was led by adults, but you made up the majority of the conversation. I think that was important because they felt like they were heard. Um, they also followed up with us on a regular basis just to let us know what was happening. And I think that was important to make them feel like they were connected in something bigger than just themselves. And it was a very positive experience. And I thought it would be um, good just to cover that so that um, people kind of had um, a real life experience that could be used. And that's my part. Taylor? To unmute my, my phone here. Um, perfect. So I'm going to be uh, not totally switching gears, pretty much um, kind of covering the same things, um, but talking more about um, life promotion um, versus suicide prevention. Um, just going to wait for a few seconds for my slides to come up. Maybe. There we go. Found them. Perfect. Um, so yeah, kind of touching on, on what, uh, <laughs> what Trina was saying. Um, and kind of just going to start off talking about the difference between um, life promotion and suicide prevention. Um, I think we, um, you know, in the system, we kind of use the two terms interchangeably, even though they mean two very, uh, very different things. Um, they're really completely different approaches. Um, you know, life promotion is kind of the big picture. You know, we're looking at um, a whole human being and what makes them who they are, you know, their, their past, their roots, um, their ambitions. Um, and we're not looking at this one part of them. Um, you know, we're not looking them, at them as someone that has suicidal ideation or maybe attempting suicide, but we're looking at the whole picture and, and, and you know, what, how do we, you know, stop, like, the big, the big picture, right? Because there's not just one small little thing that leads a young person or anyone um, to, to having suicidal ideation. You know, it's a, it's a big picture. So that's how we need to look at it. Um, so, um, you know, when we're looking at, uh, you know, these two terms versus each other, um, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand with, you know, the, the centers and this project um, specifically together to live and, and looking at how can we go into a community and, you know, take a full community approach um, and look at the lives of our young people within that community and, and, you know, looking at, frankly, how can we, you know, turn this community into a place where youth want to stick around, you know, and youth want to be a part of their community and be engaged and and participate and, and have ambitions um, um, and that kind of thing, and then talk about youth engagement and how that fits into all of that. Um, so I'm going to start off um, with my personal involvement. Um, and, and I'm from London, so I'm from a fairly big city, so I'm just going to be speaking from, you know, my personal experience and that. Um, when I was about 14, I started, you know, to take a real in, uh, interest in performing music and writing music and playing shows around my city. 
Um, and a lot of my best friends at the time were involved in this program called Mind Your Mind, um, this provincial program that um, is based in London. Um, also where I met Alicia and Trina, we're all you know, involved in that too. <laughs> um, but um, you know, back when I was a 14-year-old little baby, um, they were um, celebrating this annual thing on August 12th called International Youth Day. Um, and because my friends were involved in that, um, I ended up uh, being a finalist in it and performing some of my music um, there. I threw in a little picture of little baby me. It's not an embarrassing one because I'm not going to embarrass myself with that. But, um, so that's um, the concert hall that they had it. Um, and basically the event was just made to you know, showcase the abilities and, and talents that their youth partners and youth within the community had. It was to raise awareness about programs. Um, and it's really a great, you know, example of what you can do in your community um, to showcase and um, and honestly, just you know, thank youth for for what they do for your community and to change the conversation from, you know, a negative oh those young people to you know wow look at the young people that are in our community that are doing incredible things like let's help them and keep doing that. Um, and then a few months later, uh, one of the youth coordinators at Mind Your Mind um, actually got an interview. Um, for a band that she knew that I loved and, you know, found my contact information and connected with me and ended up giving an interview for that band as well. Um, and then I'm just going to note in the story that at this point I wasn't interested at all in mental health. I really didn't care about it. I didn't know anything about it. Um, I had no idea what Mind Your Mind actually did apart from, you know, letting me perform on a good stage. <laughs> like, I had no idea. Um, but then after that interview, you know, I kept... Um, they had launch events, and I kept going back, and they said, oh, you know, we're having this event. Come play music at it. Um, and really not caring that I didn't care that they, you know, had something to do with mental health, but knowing that um, I did something that, you know, could help them out. And they kept inviting me back and back. And, you know, uh, programs like this are sometimes like black holes. They kind of suck you in, and then you kind of never get out of them, really. <laughs> um, so then I ended up going on to one of their youth teams to help plan the next International Youth Day. And then going back to another street team um, to help redesign the website, mindyourmind.ca. And then ended up being hired on as a summer student. And I worked there until the end of this past year. Um, and through that time, I got involved in projects with the center, you know, in this Together to Live project, becoming a certified youth engagement trainer through them and going, going all across Ontario and, you know, speaking at ministry meetings and somehow became this you know, full-blown mental health advocate, um, you know, and it's something that really defines my teenage years. Um, and for a kid that, you know, entered high school as this, you know, small, depressed, super anxious kid that, you know, frankly didn't think they were worth much, you know, um, managed to escape high school, you know, as a person that believed in themselves. And, and you know, the story, what's really important is that, you know, it didn't have anything to do with the program, you know, saying, hey, 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 come do what we love. Come, you know, do what our goals are. You know, it was all about, you know, how I wanted to be involved with the program and how um, they could help me, you know, develop the skills and tools that I needed. And, you know, through that, you know, developing really necessary skills and things that allowed me to succeed in my own life and what I'm doing now, you know, six, seven years later, um, it's really, you know, it was this huge thing that wasn't intended to save my life, but did. You know, it wasn't a, a suicide prevention tactic that Mind Your Mind and the Center of Excellence were using. It was just involving youth for their skills and their talents and, and you know, being this part of their, their journey that um, really helps them. Um, so that's me. Um, so I'm going to go back to life promotion. Um, and, and what that means. And life promotion to me really means building a community that young people want to exist with. And, you know, um, it's to get away, um, you know, from the idea that there are youth and then there are, you know, youth with mental health issues and then there are youth with um, suicidal ideation and then there are youth with suicide attempts. You know, youth don't congregate in these little boxes and we don't, you know, only go with the people that are like us. You know, we're all kind of meshed together and we're all in very different places and we're all, we all have very different socioeconomic statuses, you know, but we all, you know, we all are kind of fitting together and, and trying to get by in the same way. Um, and that's how um, 
programs need to exist. Your programs exist within these boxes that stop you from getting the help that they um, that they need, and um, and you know we need to start um, talking to each other and and you know working within a community setting. Um, so and a part of that, I'm just going to start off. Um, it means involving youth in the programs that you have from the very start. You know, even as a 20-year-old, I have no idea what a 14-year-old going into high school in 2016 will need. I have no clue what that is. I'm sure it's already very different from when I went into high school. Um, there are there are even social media things that I have no idea exist. And you know, I've only been out of high school for two years. You know, so it's very important that we take. Um, the young people that are going through these experiences and putting them back into what they're doing um, and ask them what they need and what they're doing and involve them from the programs at the start. Um, but then to play devil's advocate to that as well, because that's always fun, um, I think the idea of community building needs to get away that we need to constantly create new programs for young people um, to exist within. Um, you know, there are so many things that youth run in my city um, that programs know nothing about. You know, so often you hear programs and organizations complain and, and frankly kind of whine about how, you know, the youth don't come to my programs and my programs are so great. Um, but those programs didn't actually do a scan of their city or community to find out what's happening and what was already existing within that community. You know, if you create a homework program to help grade nine students um, you know, learn math, but they've already decided that they're going to meet at this person's house at this time. They're not going to change their life to go fit your program, right? So you need to you need to do a good skin, and you need to actually have conversations with young people and figure out what they're doing, what they need, because they will tell you if you ask them. Um, and what that does is, you know, it creates trust in within a community um, that young people um, exist within, want to participate in, advocate in. And then, you know, will then go um, to tell their friends about. You know, word of mouth is, you know, much better than any poster that any graphic designer is going to create. Um, let's just see what's next there. I always forget to do my slides. There we go. Um, and what that kind of goes into when you ask the young person what they need, you know, the average young person isn't going to tell you, um, that they want to be a full-blown mental health advocate, and that's all they want to do with their life. Um, you know, if I would have known the amount of stress that came along with working in the nonprofit sector, I may not have picked it as a little 14-year-old. Um, I might not have chosen to run into the, the, the field with my arms wide open saying, come stress me out, I love stress, come give it to me. You know, um, but I got involved in a way that really made sense to me. Um, and through that, you know, every year it kind of evolves into the way that it makes sense for me, and then that's okay. Um, and I think um, I think when we accept that, you know, we kind of create leaders um, that really are mental health advocates, and we you know we're respecting the fact that the guy that you know volunteers to run a basketball team for young kids is just as much as a mental health advocate as we are sitting here talking to all of you. Um, and it kind of goes away from, you know, there's a mental health sector and then there's, you know, the community. You know, we all, mental health is just a small part of the community. And I think that's what life promotion hits. Um, we kind of already um, talked about how we support youth and what they're doing. Um, and I wanted to just kind of end on, you know, how does this all happen? And really, it, you know, it means that, you know, everyone's talking to each other, and it means that, you know, suicide prevention hits on there's a counselor, there's a psychiatrist, there's a youth, there might be a family, there might be a guardian, you know, and then that's this little bubble that sits in a room and talks about um, suicide prevention and how can we, you know, just treat this young kid so that way we get, instead of get them out of the emergency room, we get them out of services, and then they can go back to their life, but we don't care what that life is, you know, and that's why that that small kid is going to come back because he's not getting the help that he needs, which is where life promotion comes in. And what life promotion is, is a full community effort, which is kind of what Together to Live gets at, um, you know, where you, you know, suddenly, instead of just having this small pool of money with this emergency room, a psychiatrist and a counselor and a young person, suddenly you have a free basketball program on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and you have a breakfast program 
program at school, and you have um, an after-school program that helps young people uh, learn math, and you have all of this huge community effort that then goes in alongside, you know, the psychiatrist and the counselor that a young person really might need, because it's not to discourage the idea that we do need suicide prevention tactics, because we do, and some young people really do need to go into treatment, and they do need to be in the hospital, but then when they leave, you know, what do they get? They have their community, and we need to figure out how to integrate um, young people into that community, and what that means is that we have to share our resources, and we have to talk to each other. Um, we need to share the share the hedge. I just love this picture. That's why I always put it in my presentations. I think it's the cutest thing. Um, but that's kind of what we need to do. Um, and it really just, I'm going to end on the idea that life promotion isn't a Band-Aid in the way that suicide prevention is. You know, it's not putting a small Band-Aid onto something that is a much bigger problem. You know, we, need, we can't just say we want to stop young people from dying because, of course, we want to stop them from dying, but we also want them to really enjoy living. We want them to, you know, love the life that they're going to go out to after they finish the hospital, you know, and that really comes along with this community um, approach that is successful. You know, if we, if we only focus on suicide prevention, we're going to fail. And that's why the system has been failing, because we haven't been looking at a community-wide approach, because it's a really hard work to do, but it's, you know, it's the right work that we have to do. Um, and I think that's where I'm going to end off, so we have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it's me. Uh, um, my name is Alicia, and um, unlike my two other presenters, I actually don't have slides. We can just leave it on that light bulb one. Um, so what I'm going to hear to talk to you a little bit about today is um, why youth engagement is actually uh, in in life promotion is actually a two way street. Um, a lot of folks when they talk about um, youth engagement. And they talk about you know a lot of the programs and, and doing a lot of the stuff that uh, Taylor and Sheena talked about. They always talk about how um, you know how they're doing such a good job, how they're helping young people, and how you know it kind of, it, it ends up kind of being this weird um, power conversation where um, there's like oh I'm engaging you because I'm the expert and you're the one who needs to be engaged because. Otherwise, you'll stay sick, and it's a kind of a <laughs> very um, belittling way of doing it. Um, and and I really want to try and convince people that uh, it is very much a, a two way street. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, who I am. So my name is Alicia. Um, I, much like uh, Trina and Taylor, have really been helped with youth engagement in my life. Um, I lived in hiding with depression and anxiety for a really long time. Um, and I didn't really decide to be open uh, with my story, with my suicide attempt, uh, until until I had lost um, four four friends in one year to to suicide. And uh, that year, I tell people I went to more funerals than birthday parties, and um, that really just kicked kicked my butt and made me think that maybe if I had, you know, been open with my experience, that we could have done something to create a world or a community where people did feel like they could keep living. Um, and I really wanted to go somewhere and to talk to somebody about about this and, and partner with people to feel like I could actually make that change. And most places, um, they, they thought I was really cute and they wanted me to sell t-shirts for them or pro promote their campaigns or um, like speak at events for them, but they wouldn't let me actually create any change and it was super frustrating. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I actually, and in this time it actually happens uh, also to be Mind Your Mind, um, but uh, when I connected with somebody from Mind Your Mind who randomly added me on Facebook one day and he had this like, the only reason why I added him back is because he had a fake mohawk, and I thought that hairstyle looked ridiculous, so I wanted to know more about this guy. Um, and so then we started talking, and it was, and I was kind of bitter, and I, because I didn't really feel like people cared or people really wanted to listen, and I, and I, you know, part of me felt like I, I had, you know, something to offer, knowing so much about my community, but the same part of me also knew that, like, who was I? I was just this young person, um, and 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 I and I didn't feel a right to 
to be empowered in my voice. So I had this definitely like this split, split brain about it. But um, I went uh, to hang out and Mind Your Mind. I helped them create a, um, a newcomer resource, uh, being from a newcomer family myself. And it was really cool because it was the first time that somebody didn't just see me as, oh, this young person that we need to engage and we need to let them know that they're worth something, but actually as an equal partner to let me know that I have, you know, a voice and that I I have something to offer that they're just not being nice by letting me in and they're it and and they're gonna fix everything when I leave. Um, as a funny story about this, um, my uh, my friend my friend ran a program about people who go to Africa to build houses, and she was telling me that actually after all the all the young white people leave, the construction workers come in at night and actually built the house, and that and I didn't want that. I wanted somebody um, in in mental health who really trusted me and and trusted what I was saying instead of instead of li pretending to listen and then going and uh, fixing go back and fixing and making it what they wanted after anyway um, so one of the so basically what I'm just going to try and uh, sell you on is is about really looking at youth as equal partners and the first and the first kind of point I have to say about this is that Something that Taylor, I think, did a really good job of covering is that young people um, in the community will know where uh, where your youth are hanging out and what programs are they accessing and what is the reputation of an organization. There's been some times where an organization got somebody in who was really youth friendly, who wanted to engage youth, but the youth had such a bad um, bad feeling about that organization or had been so mistreated there before by previous staff that they could, you couldn't just start a youth engagement program. You had to address the way the community felt about that program and then you could start from there. But that information you wouldn't know unless you talk to young people. The other thing that they will sh they can share with you is where are the young people in your community meeting? Like what apps are they using and where are they going? Um, uh, and so that you can get some of your information about the cool programs, whether it's a bit basketball program or you have a new clinic in your town or, or um, you just want to write a new policy about something, um, they can, you can see where these people are meeting up. Like I can't, uh, I can't tell you the number of people who, um, who like has been surprised when I tell people that um, I, I work as a community moderator for an app called Talk Life. And uh, we get 40,000 posts a day and have 180,000 active users who are all youth. And these, and in that community, I, I am able to refer young people to actually check out resources. And I access these young people in a way that I know people in their home communities are trying to access through, you know, Twitter ads or Facebook ads or through posters in their school. And so really having the youth have that access to this resource of information about knowing where they are um, the youth also know what they what you what they want, um, and I think this is really interesting. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, I worked with a a program in Toronto uh, that talked about uh, providing counseling to uh, international students who um, were from various places in China. And um, the people running the program were like, "Oh yeah, we're gonna get translators there. It's gonna be really cool." And um, and then like one week into the program, they realized that none of the youth actually wanted counseling in in Mandarin. That they had they had never thought to actually ask. And counseling to the to those youth was a very um, North American concept. And that without asking, um, they they ended up spending all this money and all this time training these these counselors that spoke Mandarin. That they ended up just speaking English the entire eight week program. So it is really important to um, to ask youth. Uh, the youth will know what they want and know what they're willing to do and um, and know what they're willing uh, to engage with and not engage with. Um, and the other thing that I will just say is that, and I, uh, I think this is both co covered well by Taylor and Trina, is that young people are more than just young. That means that they have some sort of skill that that can re really help and benefit your program. So a lot of young people, I know the stereotype is that young people are really good at social media, but there's other things too, like, uh, you know, Taylor talks about being a musician. Um, I really like graphic design. I have friends who are photographers, some people who are good at social media, but also good at a whole host of other things um, and can really uh, uh, help play a role in that 
aspect of your program as well in figuring out how to utilize their skills beyond being under the age of 25 or 30, um, which is, is as something as Carrie Fisher said last week, being young and beautiful is a, is the, uh, the, the blessings of chance and time. It's not actually a skill. Um, <laughs> so having more than having also being more of uh, looking at what the young people are interested in, what skills are they creating for themselves, and uh, what are they already just really good at. And um, it's important to uh, to really look into that kind of stuff. Um, I'll end I'll end my section here on on a bit of a story. Um, and this story seems to hit home with people. I warn you, it's a tad bit dramatic. Um, but uh, as a co-op student at the University of Waterloo, um, I worked at BlackBerry while it was failing. Um, I saw 2,000 people get fired before I came and came, and 3,000 people got fired during my time working there. I saw people lose their homes. I saw people, like really good people who were amazing at their job, lose their jobs. And the whole time that I was sitting there, I was wondering, why is this happening? And um, and then it really came down to um, what happened is BlackBerry thought they were they were too good to listen to their users. That they that they had excuses for every time that they that someone would bring up a feature that didn't work or something that wasn't uh, doing well. And um, and at the same time, they also gave their when they started to fail instead of slowing down and talking to their users to fix it, they started speeding up and having more deadlines and taking too many opportunities. And they created this humongous space for uh, another place to come in and to learn from from their users and create something awesome that would take people. And um, a lot through this whole process, a lot of people would say that BlackBerry was too big to fail because it owned 26 buildings in Waterloo. And they actually named their buildings 1 through 26. But anyway, um, but it and and now it's one building mostly filled with patent lawyers, and to me, uh, I, I draw a really strong correlation with what happens in the mental health system if we find ourselves too busy or moving too fast to talk to the youth, because if we um, if we keep running, being like, no, I think I know best, and I have too many deadlines, and I'm not going to be mindful, and we can't really meaningfully engage youth, is uh, we as a whole system. Um, have a hard time learning from our mistakes and being mindful and slowing down and being like, how can we build this really good? Um, that we we sometimes are creating this huge space that if if someone rolled in and listened uh, to the young people and and uh, had a really um, and had a really good way of learning from our mistakes, that they would come in and uh, create something. And then all the amazing people I know in the mental health system, all the amazing programs, they won't be there anymore. So this is more of a plea than anything that um, when organizations get busy and people lose money, the first thing to go is youth engagement. But I think we, we, we need to learn from our mistakes in that regard. We need to be mindful. And um, most importantly, um, we need to focus on being good rather than being the best. Because a lot of the times we want to be the best or the first or the only, but if you're the best of all the not so great programs, that's not so great, not so good. So try and be good, um, be that program that you want to be, and build it with your young people so that if someone does come around wanting to create something new, that you're you're a great and you're a really strong program. Thank you. Thank you, um, Trina, Taylor, and Alicia. Um, I think a lot of what you touched on, and I'm going to just go to the next slide. Um, I know a few times it was referred, um, each of you referred a bit to the Together to Live website um, and the tools available on that website. And the center is launching soon a new youth engagement online toolkit. Um, and there's lots of helpful tools that touch on a lot of the things that you mentioned today. And, um, I think what resonated most with me was the importance of creating meaningful opportunities and in creating authentic relationships between youth themselves and between service providers and other community members, for that matter, for thinking at community-wide um, youth suicide prevention initiatives. Um, I know some of the high-level um, principles that kind of stood out um, that you mentioned was really valuing youth as assets to the community. They all have wonderful skills that they can bring 
and, and improve the work that we're doing in our communities. Um, and really doing a participa using participatory leadership, so really um, working with youth. And it's the, the notion of nothing about us without us. So by, by working with youth and, and using their perspectives and co-creating together, um, we can create better services and better programs. Um, and the idea of authentic relationships, as I already said, and I think a few, each of you actually touched on the idea of health equity. Um, so we need to look at all the social determinants of health, and, and that means building in multiple different service providers in different sectors, um, and youth, youth and family voice, too. Um, and I think another key thing that you guys touched on was really meeting youth where they're at. Um, so um, and also you touched on the idea of the whole community approach, and I think that also is the idea of multiple systems and, um, and people and players that need to work together, and particularly youth as, as the users of the services. Um, so these are all sort of some of the safety pr principles, or um, seven, the guiding principles that we kind of promote through the Together to Live website. And I have this, web, this link here that kind of gives you a link to, um, to find more information if you're interested and to download some of our, our tools and resources that have more information on these, these high-level high ideas. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any questions from the audience. I'm noticing the chat box has gone um, active now. Um, Alicia, one question that Jackie has asked you, um, is there any way they can access the newcomer resource that you created? I'm just, I'm going to go grab a link. It's, a, it's an interactive and it talks, and it talks about um, how to express n negative emotions in many different languages. So I'm going to go grab it from the Mind Your Mind website and I'll pop it in the chat box. Great. Um, another question that we had was from Brenda. It says, often, she says, often mental health professionals are reluctant to engage youth unless the process is based on evidence and approved according to the research methods. Do you have any thoughts or comments on this? Um, I had one. Just as soon as it was said, for me, I realized, you know, when I was first engaged, and second, like, any time I've been engaged, I never once thought to myself, I hope that this process has been approved. It was never a uh, determining factor to whether I would be engaged or not. I can see from the point of professionals why they would want the process to be, um, you know, um, based on evidence and already approved, but from my perspective at least, with youth, it's, that has never been a concern. It's never been a priority for me. I don't know about Taylor and Alicia. Um, I would say that, I mean, because, you know, young people are, you know, digital natives that, you know, have grown up with technology, like, you just can't rely on evidence, like, completely anymore. It's impossible to evaluate every little thing that you're doing. It's impossible to evaluate every single app and everything within it. Um, and if, if you're looking to evaluate everything, um, you're probably just going to fail um, because you won't be able to keep up. You know, youth culture um, goes so fast now that, you know, you need to essentially just listen to your evidence. You know, you can go to youth and you can research it and you can see what's happening with it, or you could just ask them. Um, and save yourself a lot of time and money. Um, that would be my my two cents into it. I and I, and just to to kind of go off of what Taylor was saying, I spent a lot of time when I was in university being somebody's research assistant, and a lot of the traditional evidence that people talk about in terms of literature um, is done on first year psychology students who are being bribed to be there. Um, it's done on people who are. Uh, who have filled out a measure and that measure has pseudo-diagnosed them with depression, for example. Um, or it was done, even if it was done in community, it was done with a particular community at a particular place in a particular time, probably years ago. Um, and so while evidence is definitely not something to completely disregard, I don't think, but it is not, um, it's not necessarily, I think, as invaluable as 
uh, traditional researchers have uh, been brought up to believe. Uh, it can have issues and problems as well. And I think the one space that really highlights that is when you're looking at online text solutions and you're looking at um, like which ones of these mental health apps have the most users. And a lot of places, you know, psychiatrists and, and, and researchers will make these apps now and they will, and like Taylor said, they will fail. Like they base them off of evidence and education, but there's no users, no users are there. And then you look at apps like Seven Cups of Tea and Talk Life who were made by like three guys in their basement and Seven Cups of Tea sees a million users a day and, and uh, Talk Life sees like 40,000 posts a day. And to me, that, that, that also speaks a little bit to evidence because these numbers are showing you that maybe the, way, the evidence that you're looking at or the way we're talking about evidence is not actually creating the things that the youth want to use. Um, and we see this in the traditional system a lot, too, because we'll make evidence-based programs with, and that end up having long waiting lists. And then what we'll see is a phenomenon where a young person will show up to treatment once and never come back. Um, and, and really just kind of looking at that, because I think, I think we have to expand our definition of evidence to include like the numbers that we're seeing and the youth feedback about that, because I think that's valuable evidence. And, and you can get that right away. You don't have to wait for a publishing cycle of like seven years. And I'd also add that a lot of times I think evidence, you know, based professionals almost that kind of treat evidence like it's the only, it's the only valuable thing ever. Um, sometimes only look at the evidence that they want to look at. I mean, there's evidence that, you know, looks at some clinical settings as not being as efficient as we thought um, it was, you know, but no one looks at a clinical setting and says, okay, well, I guess we're just going to stop that. Um, because it's more difficult to do, but with youth engagement, you can look at evidence that says, oh, well, you know, this might not be as effective and just throw it out, right? There's evidence that's easier to turn away from than others, I think. Um, also, maybe a good point to add. I, I like how Alicia said um, broadening the understanding of what we mean by evidence. And certainly um, what we try to advocate for here at the center is using an evidence-informed approach. So it's not only basing it on the research, but like we're doing today, we're listening from youth themselves. So hearing from the, voice, the voices of youth and, and also using um, service provider judgment as well. All those pieces of information and understanding the local context, all those pieces need to fit into the decisions that, that, that we make. It's not just the research. So that was a really good question. Thank you, Brenda. Um, let's move on. Olivia Moore is asking, do you think it is important for a city to come up with the funds for youth mental health for a youth mental health facility as opposed to just having a hospital with a section? Uh, in my experience, it like it just matters about like what. Um, like the uh, the process that you use to make it, because you can make uh, I've seen it before. There's parts you can make a part of a hospital um, that people do feel comfortable in if you co-create it with youth. Um, you can build and uh, there's an example from a project I'm working on right now. They uh, put a lot of money in. They built a whole new building. They they made the walls pretty. They put bean bags in there. They had video games. Nobody showed up because they never bothered to ask the youth what they want. So for me, it's uh, it's more important about talking to your young people and figuring out what they want. Like if they want it to be associated with the hospital and ha and and tell you what it looks like and what they need to feel safe, or if they do want a separate building. Um, I I I we I can't speak for all youth all the time, but that like from my perspective and from how I was, I actually um, have moved more and more in my life to not even wanting. Um, I wouldn't really want to go into a physical location. I uh, I employ a therapist online. I get all my services and support online, and I don't see anybody in person. Quite simply, because I'm balancing three jobs, and I just don't have the time. I would say too. I think a really um, interesting um, idea is kind of going off the Headspace model. Um, something kind of similar is happening to that in London. Um, I know Access Canada is, is doing it. I'm not really involved in it. I think Alicia could probably speak better to that. But um, in London, um, it pulled off in, you know, an already existing um, place that ha was, you know, kind of a hub for youth to, to build skills and build employment skills and um, have a place to stay. And now there's, you know, mental health resources going to be in there. 
um, and then different services for them to access. Um, we have, you know, early identification um, places too that are that are kind of popping up. Um, but I, yeah, I, I'm not sure if um, if the answer is, you know, for a city to come up with a specific youth mental health um, place. You know, I don't I don't know if that's the answer. I think it just depends too on on what the youth need. Um, if they already have the facilities available and they're not accessing it, then why aren't they? What, you know, that speaks into engaging in the youth and speaking to them and asking them directly, what do you need? If it is something to do with online or if it's something to do with a non-physical space, then those are the, you know, resources that need to be shared and need to be created for that area versus just a hospital or just a facility. Because like Alicia, like I, I don't necessarily have time to, to take the transit or to take the, you know, our route to go somewhere to get help versus if I can access that help online or in a non-physical space um, where I can get the exact same treatment but in a way that is better for me um, and what my needs are. So. I think what I'm hearing from both of you um, as key key pieces to this is really about creating um, creating a positive space for youth. Um, it doesn't necessarily we're not necessarily meaning a specific health mental health facility for for youth specifically as opposed to within a hospital section. It's really just about creating that positive space for youth um, and really meeting youth where they're at. Like Alicia, how you're talking about the web based access and how how that that helps you and 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 your life. So. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. Oh, there's a follow-up to this question. Where is it? Oh, what I meant was that here in Ottawa, this is follow-up to the last question. What I, what I meant was that here in Ottawa, we have hospitals with mental health sections, but they take you in for two weeks and then they discharge you regardless of whether or not you're ready because they don't have enough room. Um, I think I can, I would speak to that. Um, based on my own experience when I was in the hospital, the hospital in Sarnia that is for um, for the mental health ward, the psychiatric ward, I suppose is what it's called, there's, there's three youth rooms that are available, three beds for youth, and um, it's on the adult floor as well. There's absolutely no separation between the two. So when I was there, um, you know, there's three beds, and it was completely full all the time, and I know at one point one of my friends who was there had to be moved to the pediatric ward when she was 17 because uh, they didn't have any room in the, the psychiatric ward, and um, I couldn't stay there any longer even though it was doing a lot of positive changes for me, and at the time, you know, they, they told me, you can't stay here, but if you go home, you're going to die. We, can, we know that. And um, so my only options were I could either move into a girl's home or I could move to London and uproot my entire life for a long-term uh, care facility with a school. So, um, my, so I chose the girl's home option, and then I was faced with, as soon as I got in, okay, well, we don't actually have the money and the government's shutting us down, so you can stay here but only for a year and then you have to leave. So for me, my own personal, I think it is important for there to be some sort of facilities for youth that can't be at home because that is a reality that home is not the greatest place and you, you need somewhere that you can go um, that is funded, that's going to be there, that's going to be stable and not continually uproot you and, and cause you to um, move your entire life when you're already going through so much. So I would say yes, I think it is important for that. I think in the interest of time, I think we have a few more questions, so we're going to move on to, um, and I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, Teresa's question, um, and her question is, what are some examples of how we can engage students in advocating for, advocating, advocating for and building an improved mental health system um, slash suicide prevention model within post-secondary? Um, I can't speak um, to specifically um, post-secondary. I never um, went 
um, to university or college. Um, but one thing I would mention is that um, living in London, a university college town, um, there's such a separation between Western and Fanshawe and the rest of our city. I have no idea what's going on at Western. As a musician, I have no idea what fans exist at Western, and I have no idea um, what goes on at Hanshaw. Um, and they don't know what's going on with us, so I think um, it's really important that um, to have those mental health supports on campus that also makes students very aware of what's happening in the community um, and what other resources exist outside of it. Um, I think uh, I think this is such a timely question. Um, given that the Toronto Star just profiled uh, a young person um, who won a legal battle against the school, um, so that the students across I think it's going to be rolled across Canada don't actually can get accommodations without specifying their mental illness. Um, and and uh, I think it's very important to uh, to have spaces to engage students in, in mental health, I think, and, and suicide prevention and life promotion. I think there's some places, uh, some clubs that are doing that. There's a lot of grassroots stuff that students are doing themselves. Um, but I think, honestly, we have to change um, we, the organizations, the administrations of the schools have to engage with their students, um, like so many schools are doing with mental health policies and plans, to fundamentally change the culture of the school Given that uh, I experienced the suicide when I was in university, and the school just pretended like it didn't happen, um, and they swept it under the rug, and the school, and we don't know the school's suicide prevention rates or anything like that. So um, I, I, I think the as a mini community, as um, as Taylor pointed out, that they they also kind of need the life promotion that we do in bigger communities. That they uh, that they do take care of um, the students when a suicide has happened. That they that when somebody is reaching out and saying that they're feeling um, suicidal, that they are uh, that they are cared for, not that they're like us, uh, that they're not kicked out of residence or threatened to be kicked out of school or told by counselors that you're not well enough to be in school. Um, that they are kind of still seen as a whole human in the spirit of life promotion. Um, and and I can't tell you the number of uh, friends I had who were kicked out of school for being unwell, and that was the trigger that that caused them to attempt suicide. Um, so I really think about uh, there's a lot students can do uh, on their own grassroots, but um, I would hope that the administration that like that like, like that has being done at UBC at U of T uh, does take some initiative to reach in and co-create with the population because they are they are many communities. Um, but so far, they have not done a really great job in creating and continuing this conversation. Okay. Um, we also have another question from Despina. Um, she says, hello, everyone. Great job. What are key elements to good co-creation? This is going to sound funny, but when your youth tell you that you're wrong, <laughs> like when, 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 when somebody actually, when, they, when there's enough trust there that if they look at something, that instead of if they think, if you present them something that they don't think is good, um, that they'll actually tell you um, and, not, and that they just won't choose to disengage. Um, so for me, that's one of the, like I actually like it when a youth group that I'm leading, like when they disagree with me and they share their opinion, because to me that means that trust has been built and that we're truly building something together. Like when I present something in the room silent, it's like, uh oh, like people don't feel like they can share what they really think. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that completely. And I think like it's hard to answer questions like that because, you know, the first step, I would say, I guess the first step to co-creation and doing it well is like when you're applying for grants to do projects is that, you know, part of your budget is saying, okay, well, we're going to need a youth co-facilitator because we're creating something for you. So if they're not there, we're not doing a good job of it. Um, it's always a good thing. And then saying, okay, and we're going to have to make sure we bring a lot of youth in, and that might require travel, and we're going to have to compensate them. So we're going to add that into the budget too. And it's not just an afterthought of like, oh, I guess we, we're creating this thing with youth. I guess we probably should have planned that we were going to have to engage them. You know, it's, it's that like afterthought where it should be like the first thing you think of when you're creating something. Um, is to is to do that um, and from there I mean it kind of just 
depends on your young people, just asking, like, how can I, you know, how can we help involve you in this program, and how can, you know, how, are, how can you help us? Like, we think that your opinion is going to make a huge difference, and how can we get that in that way, I guess. Thanks, guys. Um, and maybe we'll move on to a question from Simon Davidson. Um, and he is asking, while youth engagement is more accepted now, the uptake by professionals is not nearly where it needs to be, including clinicians, educators, and researchers. How do we enhance authentic and active uptake, uptake? I think as, as weird as it, is, as it sounds to say, it, it really helps when um, professionals, you know, give their, the opinion, you know, I guess I would say the fact that involving youth in your programs is the only way to make them successful, and co-creating with youth is the only way to do that. Um, because the reality is, is that a lot of professionals just choose not to believe it, even though the research backs it up. and. It's kind of a fact at this point. You know, a lot of professionals just choose not to believe it, and sometimes, you know, hearing it come from someone that they, you know, frankly respect more, um, you know, helps helps that along. You know, so if you are creating an app, like we were all a part of this Be Safe app, and you know, when we presented, the app is such a small portion, but we always talk about how it's created. You know, how we sat around a table and built it from the ground up. Um, and that's, you know, what we present. So I think it's being really loud and obnoxious about what you're doing and how you're involving young people um, is a good way to get people on board, at least until people start, you know, really, it stops being a hot topic and it starts being something that we just do naturally. Yeah, and I'll just add to what uh, Taylor was saying. By, by It sounds a little bit crude, but uh, tying, tying funding money to it, um, uh, has does does a lot if you if you if people won't get their grant or lose their grant by not engaging youth um they're they'll begrudgingly but <laughs> i've noticed a lot of movement like for example um i'm a, one of the youth members of council uh, of the access project which is has a bunch of sites across the country and are implementing a new kind of treatment model and while they kind of uh understand that we have to talk to youth like a lot of times like they don't they don't really want to, and you can tell it by the way that they're acting. So the 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 thing that kind of keeps their feet to the fire is that I know the CIHR funding officer, and he asks me all the time, "How are they engaging youth?" And I can get them in big trouble. So sometimes it's about it's 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 bad and competitive, but sometimes I think it is about funding tying funding dollars to engaging young people, to making sure that there's young people there, and to making sure that. Um, and to having it having more things in your grant application than how many youth were involved in this program, like having things about how will you involve youth and, and really pushing past that tokenistic thing that just comes with you need to involve 500 people or one person um, to be youth engaged. Um, I know that's, I, I, I wish that I could just like make everybody really want to do youth engagement and be as empowered by it as I am, but uh, some I, I know some folks are, are, are holding on to not wanting to do it, and so it's a, sometimes I think it's about you know highlighting your promising practices, like uh, Taylor was saying, but also kind of forcing them to do it by tying it to funding dollars. We also have one last question, so it's from Judy North. Um, communities are often concerned they may place youth at risk by involving them in suicide prevention related activities. Do you have any recommendations on how to involve youth safely? Uh, I would say um, to check in on the process at several different times. So um, the thing is is that the youth, like, you can't, you can't save youth from this kind of stress. You can't like protect them by not involving them, which is a lot of things that people like, I've seen that kind of mandate before. Um, but uh, I would say that like you know it's about having that open communication. If a young person says that a process has harmed them in some way, like uh, 
I had a, one of my projects, there was a communications manager was talking to the youth about their stories, and she called people and said, you have 15 minutes, and my friend felt like he had to rush his story into 15 minutes, and he relapsed. And when he told her about that, she got really defensive and protective and, and harmed him further rather than, like, allowing that conversation to happen and allowing that to hear what he was saying, not that she was bad at her job, but that the process was hurtful and that they needed to be changed. Um, and, and, yeah, I would just say checking in with the process uh, several times and, and letting the youth let, tell you what they can and what they want to do and what they kind of can't handle, but you're not going to protect youth from the concept of suicide if someone's died in your community. Chances are they heard about it. Chances are it's their friend. Um, so by not involving them, I actually think you probably, it's more unsafe and you're probably hurting them more. Um, I would add to that too, I think with, you know, if anyone even is at risk and you're worried about, um, you know, promoting suicide or making it more of a making it more known to them about it or anything like that. Like, if anyone is at risk, they're already thinking about it. And by including them in something, you're not going to be, you know, increasing it um, or causing them to think about it more than they already would. And I think as well, um, logistically, I've been in certain um, organizations and programs where, you know, just things like safe spaces um, that they've had. Um, they've had, you know, like rooms that they have identified at the beginning of the session, session saying, you know, if you need to take a minute to yourself, this is a safe space, you can go there, or, you know, we have someone there you can talk to if that's what you want. That's a logistical aspect that I think is important. And, it, you know, I've known people that do use it. And if you are creating a safe space where, you know, you feel comfortable with the adults in the room, you know, they, they can tell you. I think that for me, if I'm comfortable with someone that I'm working with who is an adult, um, you know, if I feel safe, I will go to them. I will say, you know, I'm feeling stressed. I need to leave for a second or I need to take a break. Or if I, if we're creating this space, I think that level of comfort should be there where you feel comfortable to tell them when you don't feel safe. And I think, like Alicia said, by not including them, it's just going to hurt in the long run. And you do have to take that risk if you want the results in the future. Yeah, I would totally agree with that, like having safe spaces for young people to go and leave the situation. Um, I would also say that I guess it, it is completely dependent on the person, but um, I'll use an example um, of a conference. It was the International uh, Child Youth Mental Health Con I don't know. It was in Montreal, but they had the best uh, safe space that um, I've ever experienced. It was just a place that was totally separated from the conference. It was up tons of flights of stairs from it. And there was always a young person there. So there was a young person that would just hang out in the room and be like, you, you're you okay? You just want to, like, take a nap? Like, do you need me to go um, get someone for you? You know, someone that was really trained in peer support. And, yes, exact same. The International Association for Youth Mental Health Conference. That's what it is. Bingo. Um, but it was so successful. You know, I've been to conferences where you leave, you know, a young person leaves the room and five, like, people chase after them. And you're like, I'm just, I'm just, like, I, I just needed to be alone. <laughs> or I just needed to, you know, yeah. talk to them, You know, like, I don't want to feel like I'm being, like, chased out of the room and suddenly everyone's heads turn to you and, like, oh, a young person is, is sticking over there and we need to go help them and save them you know you, you know you always it's so dependent but like there also has to be a little bit of trust because that young person when they're out of your care is probably going to hear the word suicide or is going to hear about suicide and it's so much better that if they can be prepared for that with your help in that situation um i think that would be a much better way to you know equip them yeah, as I uh, I had a panic attack in the middle of a big meeting last year, and and I got like, like all of a sudden like a hundred counselors like convulged on top of me, and it was actually like more harmful. It was not it was not fun because like all I wanted to do was have space to breathe, and so I think like if having somebody there for them to talk to, but it has to be one person. It can't just be like all these people when somebody leaves the room, where'd they go? Are they okay? And it's just kind of like, it reminds you that the way that everybody in that room sees you is sick and, and, and not as a human. Um, and so having the resources there if somebody needs it, but, but allowing them to kind of ask to know where they're at and ask for it if they need it a little bit instead of bombarding them with counselor bombs. 
So what I think what this is really emphasizing is that it's not a matter when we're doing youth engagement, it's not a matter of just bringing a youth to the table, but it's about thoughtfully thinking through and creating a structure for youth that makes it a positive space and that allows for clinical safety and clinical support. Um, and you'll see that we just put in the chat box. We actually created a tool um, that talks about some of these considerations to think about um, when, when doing youth engagement. Um, and a lot of this is, is going to be in the youth engagement toolkit that, that we're releasing um, coming soon. So um, feel free to check that out if you wanted to read a bit more as well. But a lot of what um, Taylor, Alicia, and Trina have mentioned are, are things that, that you'll see in that, in that tool. And I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, for, before we wrap up, do we have one final question? Or is everyone, I'm looking to see if Jackie had another question. No. So I think we'll just go ahead and wrap things up. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know that we do still have three upcoming um, e-forums that I wanted to remind you of before, before we wrap up. Um, so we, our next one's February 10th, and that's specifically on e-evaluation. Um, and then on February 18th, we have one, an interactive panel on strategic planning where we'll have a few communities that have been through the process that will share their experiences with you. Um, and then on February 24th, we have our final one, which is looking at collective impact and specifically talking about sustaining and growing community collaborations. Um, so if you want more information on those upcoming events, you can check out the link on this, um, on this slide deck. And you can stay in touch here. And, and I just wanted to say thank you so much to Taylor, Trina, and Alicia um, for your very um, informative presentation. And I think um, there's lots of info that was shared today and lots of things that, that people can, can take away um, with them today. And I also wanted to thank everyone who's participating um, and for, for taking the time to join us today in our second, our second um, e-forum. And just as a quick reminder, don't forget to fill out our evaluation survey following this forum. Um, it'll pop up in your, on your internet, or internet browser um, as soon as we close this session. Um, and we're really using this information to help improve these series as they, as they move forward. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. And especially thank you, Taylor, Alicia, and Trina. Um, very, very great and informative.